Hello, everyone. My name is John Cunningham, and this is the VRAR Bytes podcast. We're exploring the topic of are we at the tipping point for XR? Now, Malcolm Gladwell defines the tipping point as that magic moment when an idea, trend, or social behavior crosses a threshold, tips, and spreads like wildfire. Well, XR has been a hot topic for many years, and especially recently with new devices from HTC, Magic Leap, Meta, and a promise from Apple to redefine spatial computing with the Apple Vision Pro. But are we really at the point where the technology is becoming ubiquitous? So today, my guest is Chief Master Sergeant Powell Kreider, who's been serving in the United States Air Force for 32 years as a National Guardsman. His rank is a Chief Master Sergeant which is the highest enlisted rank that someone can achieve. And you can tell because he has lots of stripes on his uniform. And Powell is also one of the program managers for a program called MOTAR, which is a delivery analysis and reporting platform that's postured to become a one-stop shop for XR delivery for the Department of Defense. Now, Powell's background is as an aircraft mechanic. And as a senior mechanic trainer, he created a concept in 2019 for using augmented reality to guide aircraft maintainers to be more efficient to repair aircraft. Now he called the initiative Maintenance, Operations and Training in Augmented Reality, which is where the acronym MOTAR came from. And in 2018, he won a prestigious innovation program in the Air Force called Spark Tank and got an initial grant to fund prototype development. Now this MOTAR is now in the hands of the Air Force Rapid Sustainment Office and has evolved into a one-stop shop for augmented and virtual reality programs and is envisioned to expand across the Department of Defense. So I need to add today that Powell is not an official representative of the Air Force and the opinions that he expresses in this interview are are his own, okay? Well, Powell, welcome to the VRAR Bytes podcast. Hey, thanks for having me. All right. So, hey, you know, you've been working on Motar for a long time. And are you happy to see where your concept has gone? I am. I'm um, I'm very pleased, of course, and thankful that we've been able to get as far as we have. We know with the work we've done. We uh, and it is funny how the concept had to change from my original ideas to what what it became, because like when I was pitching the stuff originally, you know, and trying to come up with it, I was thinking at the pointy end of the stick, you know, I was thinking of the augmented reality on the flight line, getting it to the people, you know, and I really thought that we were almost there. But then once I got inside the system and started working with AFWorks, we realized that while we were looking at the pointy end of the stick, we hadn't even cut down the tree to make the half for the spear. Yeah. You know, yeah. so we had to go back and start with this with the concept of a delivery platform to get there, to to get to the point where we can actually get the AR VR content out to the individuals in the field that need it in a secure way and in a way that allows for the airmen to be part of the creative process. Right. And so what you quickly or the Air Force quickly came to realize is they understood the value of putting the technology onto a mechanic, sending instructions. But how do you scale it to the tens of thousands of mechanics out there around the world? You got to solve that problem first. How do you get it to them? That was the main problem. Our, you know, the the Nippernet wasn't designed for it. Mm-hmm. Commercial Internet didn't have easy inroads. There's a lot of other obstacles. So we had to really figure out how to cross all those. Right. And and also, I mean, you're working on uh, secure, confidential, classified aircraft. You can't just open that data up onto a, a public network. And right. so, so, you know, this is an example of where you had to deal with the scale. You know, you, you everybody got the concept and you knew you could create the content to make it happen, but you had right. to quickly deal with the infrastructure issues. Yeah. We had to find a way to, you know, analogy wise to build the roads to get to where we needed to go because the roads didn't even exist. So it didn't matter if you had the the best, you know, vehicle for delivering the content, you had no way of getting it from point A to point B. So we had to really start at the beginning and, and start developing something that could do the job. Yeah. And, and I'm glad you said that because as we've been been interviewing a lot of people and talking about adoption of XR, something that continuously comes up is infrastructure, right? The ability to scale it. So we'll talk about that more in a moment. But sure. here's what I want to ask you. So where did you first see or, 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 you know, when did you have that aha moment that augmented reality was the right technology to help mechanics? Well, uh, it, that's really funny because 
A, I'll point out, I'm a huge nerd. I, I've been into this stuff <laughs> for years and years. So I will give that caveat off the yeah. bat. Um, I remember when I was a uh, senior airman. So this was in around 1992 or 93. Um, we The C-17 was just being talked about. I was in a refueling squadron at the time, and we were actually at Edwards doing refueling tests for the the C-17. And I heard a story from Boeing that we would be using virtual reality to train on the C-17 in 1993. Mm. I was already into it. And I'd read a book from a guy called Jaron Lanier, Dr. Jaron Lanier, that was about virtual reality. It was mm -hmm. fantastic. I really got into it at that time. I was so excited that in a couple of years, we were going to have VR training for aircraft maintenance. So in 1992, 1993, you were convinced that this is going to happen. Yeah, I, I thought by, <laughs> by 1997, we would have virtual reality training. We would be doing it. And also, you know, around that time, when I get to the augmented reality side, there was a book by um, William Gibson called Virtual Light that was about like this, this aug it, it, it heavily involved in augmented reality technology, which really put that on my radar from that point. So then like fast forward and uh, I had worked on lots of different airframes and then my unit got C-17s and I was baffled to find we still didn't have VR or AR training. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I started, you know, now I was a senior master sergeant. I started hammering the, the, the bell, you know what I mean? Like pushing yep. forward and go, why are we not doing this? And I went and presented it at every, every maintenance symposium, every conference, anytime I could get in front of people with, you know, birds on their shoulders, I, I started harping on it. And finally they just, they just gave up and said, okay, do something, you know, like, here, here, here's, here's yeah go go make something happen so and then luckily the spark tank came along and i was able to actually do something about it well you know so so um i think for the for the viewers here is you know right now a lot of people are benefiting from the demand signals for the market for augmented virtual reality for training across aviation mm -hmm. you know you were one of the pioneers back here in the early 90s that said this is this could really help us and you had to go through that whole so you are, you are a true pioneer in xr well, <laughs> i'm a guy who thought about it a lot you yeah. know and, and then really wanted to see it happen okay um, all right, so let's let's jump now into our our four questions. Okay, sure. that that's kind of been the gist of this 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 question. Have we reached the tipping point of XR? So, um, Paul, what are the technology trends that you're seeing that are driving adoption of XR? The technology trends that are, that are driving it that I really see are we're finally got we finally have processing power and display power to okay. get to where we needed to be. Like in the 90s, I actually have one of the old VPL visual programming language uh, VR headsets from 1995. Uh, it doesn't work anymore, but I still have it. I'm never going to get rid of it. The refresh rate on that was was not good. You know yeah. what I mean? The visual acuity was bad, but it showed what we could do. And it, it you know what I mean? It, it showed us what our future was. Now we're actually getting there. So as the technology begins to catch up with the vision then we're able to uh then it's moving the ball ball down the field you know towards right. getting to ubiquitous xr the the problem still is that we haven't quite gotten to the point where the reality meets the promise for most yeah. people okay. you know like that and that's that's the thing we're all we're so close we're almost there so so back on that topic, you 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 think you're saying that the 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 advancements in processing power in visual displays is absolutely a critical factor to driving adoption. It's, okay. It's the primary factor. Yeah. Gotcha. Okay. Second, obviously we know that you're very focused on aviation, but besides aviation, what other industries do you see as the most likely adopters for XR technology? It's going to affect everybody. Eventually. Okay. I mean, I, I see honestly, probably in the next couple of years, because we're going to need that. We're going to need that one device, that iPad. I mean, that iPhone moment. Yeah. You know what I mean? That yeah. <clears throat> that really tips it. And I think it might come from the same company, but we're going to need to get to that point. And then you're going to see it spread to, you know, it's going to be ubiquitous. 
Okay. At that gotcha. point. And, you know, right now, like the major ones on, uh, of course, you know, my bias is towards the military training because that's what I know uh, the most is we're going to have a lot of uh, technical training. We're going to have probably tactical training. That's really, I mean, there's already really good tactical training. That one was a direct outgrowth of the video game industry. So it was in, you know, a lot easier to, to just, for people to see and for people to understand and for people to actually get at the point with now, yeah. but we're, we're really getting there with all of those other industries as well. Entertainment's going to be huge. Um, and we're, we're just, we're getting to that point. We're just okay. not quite. There gotcha. Okay. So three, now what are the hurdles or technology challenges that we still have to overcome to drive broader adoption? The first hurdle that we really have to overcome to get to broader adoption is we have to have technology that where the promise, you know, is met, right. You know, where when you put it on uh, someone, it meets the requirement that they had, you know, right away. There's no like having to guess. There's no having to use your imagination. It has to get there. We also have to figure out some way to make VR technology work on generals because right now, if you go to put it on a general, their stars cause electromagnetic interference that cause it to never work when the demo is put on their head. So we have to figure out how to make that work. Otherwise, a general is never going to actually see the XR content because I've never been able to do a demo for a general where it worked on the first time. I don't understand. Well, OK, so your 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 hypothesis that all of those metallic stars and their collars causes interference. Yeah. I, I think there might be more than that, Powell. Um, yeah. I think there's a generational thing about. No, no, it just quits on. working every time, <laughs> every time I can, I, I can set up the demo and have it working and we can play with it all morning long. And the moment a general walks in the room, the equipment quits working and they just, I'm, I'm certain they're convinced none of it actually works. Cause I don't think any of them have ever actually seen one actually work. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. Great answer. Okay. Yeah. So last question as we wrap yeah. this up. So Powell, after almost 15 years of promoting and developing an XR, do you believe we're at the tipping point for ubiquitous adoption? I believe we can see the tipping point. Okay. Okay. Point. You know what I mean? It's we're, we're scaling that peak and we're almost to the top. And, and I think in the next couple of years, we're going to see it, you okay. know, it's going to happen at that point. Yeah. And, and I, you know, that's kind of been the consensus of most of the folks I've talked to. Some industries are ready for scale now. Yes. But for really broad, ubiquitous adoption, these mm -hmm. leading industries are creating the funding, the technology, the infrastructure, the software that's going to then bleed over to all these other areas and it's just going to explode. Right. Yeah, we're we're very close. You know what I mean? We're we can start to feel the teeter totter starting to move. But yeah, we're just not quite there. It's going to take that that piece of technology that pushes it over. Okay. Well, right great answer. Time. Powell, thank you so much for taking the time to, to be here on the VRA Bytes podcast. Oh, you're very welcome. Thanks for having me. Have a good day, everyone. Thanks.